It was the best of BGG convention. I was going to say, it was, worst. I was gonna, it was the worst. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't really the worst. It was and great. I was going to do the best of times or the worst time. <laughs> right. It was just a good convention. We're going to talk about Board Game Geek Con Fall 2021 right now. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murph. We're here talking about the our top 10 games that we played at BGG Con. BGG Con, if you've never been, is really a game playing convention. Oh, you just excellent. hang around and play games. It's freaking awesome. And yeah. so we got to play a ton. It was the first time we had gotten to play like a lot of games, a lot of new games, basically since the pandemic. With people. It's yeah. been a very long time since we got to do this. Yeah. And it was an awesome convention. It was really great. Everyone got to spread out and stuff. We were just super comfortable. Cool. And got to meet a lot of people or see people for the first time in a long time. Yeah. We got to play some great games. We're going to talk about the 10 best games we got to play at Board Game Geek Convention. Let's get into it right now with number 10. So number 10 on our list is Almaty. This is a game by the same people that made Quadropolis, the same designers. And it's just, you can see the DNA from Quadropolis here because here you're gonna be placing these tiles out into four different rows. And it's all about adjacency from these different tiles. These tiles might show markets and palaces and oases and things like that. It's all kind of set in the Arabian Nights universe, which is fantastic. And the different edges of the tiles might have some amount of symbology and then also arrows. And so basically you line up a tile that has an arrow pointing to a certain symbol, you then get to activate that. You also get to move your tiles around through various actions. So it becomes a very thinky puzzle, but you're kind of limited in this little four by, uh, four row rather grid as you build out and you need to switch things around so you get everything ultimately lined up exactly where you need it to maximize that scoring by the end of the game. So this is one that, like I said, you can see the kind of DNA from Quadropolis here, but it presents a whole different puzzle that to me I think felt a little thinkier, maybe because it was new to me and, and I'm used to Quadropolis or something, but it was just a really interesting play, one that I want to kind of come back to, and the theming and stuff, you can kind of get these powers, these character powers, as a kind of a variant you can play with, which I recommend doing. It really gives a lot to kind of chew on, so I really enjoyed the spatial aspect, adjacency kind of uh, puzzle that you put together. So our number 10 is Almaty. So our number nine is the Dinosaur Island Roar and Right, which is just fun puns, right? We really, really like Dinosaur Island. We like Dinosaur World. We like Dinosaur Island. We actually like everything in that universe. We love the look of it. We just really enjoy that whole, at this point, series of games in that world. And we've been very, very excited for the Roar and Right because we love Roar, not Roar, Roland Rights. If you haven't seen any of our other top tens, we talk about Roland Rights a lot. We like them a lot. But one thing that we've always kind of been looking for is a beefier roll and ride. One that's a little bit longer, one that's a little bit heavier. And then this came along and this is exactly what we've been looking for. Not to mention, it's also kind of like a halfway point between Dinosaur Island and Dinosaur World. And that's kind of a good place to be. And this is really, really fun. It's basically, Dinosaur Island, you are getting DNA, you're rolling out those cool amber dice, you're getting different kinds of specialists, you're putting in different kinds of buildings, and then of course, building dinosaurs. But then it's also kind of got the dinosaur world part of it, where you are actually drawing out your dinosaur like pens and paddocks and stuff like that, and different buildings and like rides and such like that onto a little grid, and then you are gonna have like kind of a Jeep tour go through your park but you can only really visit places once, or you can visit them multiple times, but you only get an excitement bonus one time because people are like, I've been on this ride before, I don't care what's new. And so you have to really plan around that and constantly be building new stuff so that you can continually get that excitement and get those bonuses. And it's just a really good roll and ride, but it is like 30, 45 minutes. It's a bigger game in a roll and ride. There's also now a companion app, so you can just play like, Essentially, the companion app has like the whole board in there, and that works pretty darn well too, which is really, really nice. It's just really, really fun. We like the, the Roar and Write a lot, and we love Dinosaur Island in that world, and it's our number nine. So 
So number eight is a fantastic puzzle game called Project L. This was in the library and I'd always wanted to try it and we got a chance to play it. This game is satisfying because it comes with these fantastic acrylic little pieces that are, uh, they go from range from very small, kind of like a little one by one square and they become bigger and kind of a lot of the classic Tetris shapes or polyomino shapes that we've come to see in various games. There's these really sweet acrylic colorful pieces and then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking these cards that are actually dual layered and you're trying to fill in uh, each card which is just some kind of mass of empty space that you need to then fill in. So this game is satisfying because the pieces you put in are going to slot in to this dual layer board so you're going to know when you have it all full everything kind of fits nicely and every time you complete a card you will get some amount of points probably at the end of the game from that card but it's also going to provide you a new piece, a better bigger piece. And so you're kind of like engine building a little bit because as you complete these puzzles, you get better pieces, which ideally you can use to fill in puzzles using fewer actions because you only have three actions per turn. So I can place fewer things to complete puzzles to get more puzzles and points and stuff. And it just builds up in a very nice way. And as I was playing, I could, could just couldn't help but think like this is an immensely satisfying game to play because everything fits, it's beautiful, it's simple. It's abstract in a great way. Project L was a delight. Number seven is another roll and write. It just happened to me that way. This is a game called Riverside, which actually might get heard of from our good friend Matthew Jude, but I actually had never heard of it, but he pulled it out and said, hey, I heard this game is good. Let's learn it and play it. And it's a charming little roll and write. It's not nearly as heavy as like the Raw and Write, the Dinosaur Island one, but it's a little game where you are essentially taking people on excursions up in the Great White North and kind of like the Northern Lights area. It's very, very pre pretty. And you're taking people onto on a river cruise, a kind of a river boat. And off that riverboat, you're then going on excursions. And basically, you're gonna be rolling out these five colored die, and you have essentially five colored boats. You have like blue, yellow, white, brown, and pink. And on your turn, you're going, or actually everyone at the same time is gonna choose one of the die to essentially fill in seats. These are people that are coming onto that excursion. But when you roll out the die, you take the median die, the middle die, and then that die and every die below that in pip value goes in kind of like the colder zone area. And then all the higher die go above to the hot zone. So if you want to take a hot zone die, you then have to cross off these little fire markers. And there's only 14 of them in the game. So if you take like a level six that's up there, you're basically getting rid of half of those. So you can only take the really big die a couple times throughout the game. And then on top of that, the boat is gonna be moving through the river cruise and stuff like that. And so you are coming across these different excursion points and you're essentially taking people on excursions. And it's just a really simple little roll and write, but it's really, really charming. It's got this kind of like pastel Neapolitan look. And I just really love the theme of just like, you're up in the Great White North on this beautiful little river cruise. You're taking people on cool excursions. And I just love it. I think it's great. It's a charming little game. It's also one of those roll and writes that's nice because you can play it with an infinite amount of people. We play it on stream now because everyone is just simultaneously choosing from the dice. You can't choose a die and then take it away. Everyone can just choose from what's there. So you can also play it with an infinite amount of people. You can play it over Zoom, things like that. So it's a really, really cool game. Riverside is our number seven. So number six was a cooperative game by Panasaurus that we had been very interested to try. It's called The Loop. This is a game where you are kind of traveling through eras in time in an abstract fashion on this kind of round board, and you're working together to take down Dr. Foe, who's basically running around to different eras of time, creating clones of themselves, and wreaking havoc. So this is a very much kind of classic cooperative game where you are trying to manage crises, kind of like a pandemic, where <laughs> every turn something bad happens and you need to kind of deal with that and then ultimately try to also do the objectives that you need to do to win the game. And uh, clones will spawn basically, and they're gonna spawn in like the medieval era, but they're not from the medieval era, they're from like the post future era. So you need to go pick those clones up and basically move them around the board to get them back to their proper time zone before things like rifts happen. Basically the time zone can get ripped apart, bad things happen, sectors of the board get all messed up and destroyed in terms of the objectives that are there and that can lead to you losing the game. So this is a fantastic, difficult, cooperative game where you're really trying to work together and you can do that by leaving energy on the board and stuff and then by having energy around to use, you can do what's called looping. You have these kind of cards you, you play, it's kind of a mini deck building game 
And as you play these cards, if you can use energy, you can basically refresh cards that you use so long as they all have the same symbol. So you can loop, you can kind of reset time and do actions again. And that's just an immensely cool, fun thing in games and they work it really well where it feels A, very timey-wimey and moving around time and also feels very cooperative because on my turn, I'm gonna make sure energy's left there for you so that you can piggyback off what I did, make the best use of your turn to then hopefully pass on to the next player so they can make the best use of their turn. That's not always something you see in cooperative games where it feels truly cooperative um, in between turns and each person's activations. This one did a great job of that. It's beautiful, it's really colorful and fun. It's a cool theme and the loop was just satisfying. And yeah, we lost real bad, but they didn't hurt my liking of it. Number five is a game that took me by storm. This is a game that really, really surprised the heck out of me. And that is so Clover. We played this with Aldi and a couple other BGG people, and it was so much fun. This is a, a cooperative party game by Repos who make like just one. They're really kind of crushing the cooperative party game stuff right now. But this is a game where you have this like cool dry erase four leaf clover board and you're gonna be slotting in these square cards and the square cards on each side of the square are gonna have some word, some clue. Could be like blanket and brother and like dog and cat or something like that. And you basically are gonna take four of these cards and then mix them around and then put them down. So each side of the four leaf clover is gonna have two words next to it. And you then have to write a clue that pertains to those two words. But again, it's all random. So it could be like spoon and then like, I don't know, architecture. And you have to try and figure out like what clue can I write that's gonna match both of those things. It's kind of tough and kind of code names -y in that way. But then what's gonna happen is everyone's gonna be writing out their clues in secret and then they're gonna take the four cards off of their four leaf clover add a fifth card to mess with them, and then they're gonna shuffle them all up, and then they basically have to put their blank board now in the middle, put out the cards and go rearrange this correctly. And then everyone else then has to try to put the cards in the right spot. And I'll tell you, it just works. This is one of those party games that you can explain very, very quickly, and you can play with everyone. You can play with non-gamers, gamers. It's so much fun. Kind of has that code names appeal where it just kind of comes down to the people and the clues you're giving and trying to make those two words match somehow. And it's just really, really fun. And it just works so well. We bought it. We've been playing it like crazy whenever we can. And we absolutely adore So Clover. It was a big, big surprise for us. So our number four is Korra, Rise of an Empire. Now this is a game that going into BGG Con, I had high on my list of games I wanted to play. We had received a copy ourselves of this, but I hadn't had a chance to play it. I'd read the rule book and then we ran out of time. And so I was just like, this has to happen. I must play this game, it has to happen. And we got a chance to uh, play with Aldi and Aaron, who you've seen on lots of board game uh, geek stuff. Aldi owns board game geek, right? So we got to play. Uh, with him and I was like, this is our chance. We need to play this right now. And I got to teach it and uh, it went over great. I was so, you're always, when you play a game, you're like, I hope this lives up to it. If you've built up hype for yourself and I definitely done that with Korra and then it works really well. This is a game where you're bumping tracks, you're moving up things, you're gaining various kinds of economy, whether that be uh, troops when you go exploring or just economy, economy and money, which is very tight in the game and you're trying to kind of build up your engine and start running it as quick as you can because the game's only nine rounds long and you're trying to manage your citizenry which helps you with dice rolls and it's an action selection game uh, and you can just build up really cool combos in this game because there's these politics cards that you play out and they might have persistent effects, they might have a one-off boon, they might offer end game scoring opportunities that are going to craft and curate the way in the direction you kind of go throughout the game. So this is one that we all learned it and played it together, or I taught it rather, but none of us have played. And like halfway through the game, we all did the, oh, okay. Yeah, all right, I see now, I see now. And Aldi was the person who put it together the quickest. And so <laughs> he uh, crushed us all, uh, as was his right to do. We were at his convention after all. Uh, it was really fun though. It was something that we like were able to put down learn and play fairly quickly and you feel like you get a lot done and so Korra Rise of an Empire was just a big hit for me because I it lived up to the expectation I had built up in my mind uh, for better or worse ahead of time and it lived up to that so Korra Rise of an Empire is our number four.
Number three is a game called Wild Space by Pandasaurus Games. This is a game that I had heard a little bit about and being like, okay, I heard this game is pretty good and I liked the look of it, but I didn't know much else about it. And this is a game that we kind of pulled off the shelf at BGG Con because we we're like, heard it's good, let's go ahead and try and play it. And I learned the game and I was like, how is this gonna work? Because this is a game where you are building out a crew of astronauts, of, of animal astronauts, there's like bears and owls and monkeys and stuff like that. And you are essentially, you can either travel to a planet or you can explore that planet. That's the only thing you can do on your turn. And you only have 10 turns in the entire game. And you're essentially trying to put out these crew cards and these crew cards are going to essentially do a whole bunch of different stuff. They might allow you to put out another crew card or they might have some kind of scoring on them. That's just like, if you have, for every monkey and for every military you have, you'll get two points. So a lot of it is kind of like set collection matching stuff. So you're just trying to put out cards to get the most points possible, but you only have 10 turns to do it. So it's all about trying to build those combos of like, oh, I can put out this card, which allow me to put out this card. And you do all those kinds of things. And when I was reading the rules, I was like, so you're basically only gonna be able to do like two things in this whole game. Cause it just seems like a short game, but man, you can just get a lot done. You find ways to really stretch out your turns and to really get a lot of crew down and try to get a lot of points. And it's really, really fun and much, much more of a puzzle than it seems at first. And I really love games like that, that have kind of like simpler rules and kind of like, okay, this is all that's happening. But then when you start playing it, your mind starts going like <laughs> crunching up. You're like, oh, this is a much heavier puzzle than I was expecting. It's a really, really good game with a really good look. And uh, we really liked a lot and that's Wild Space. So number two was the biggest surprise of the convention and really of the year, I'd say. Uh, this was Seven Wonders Architects. I had heard about this game and that got announced and there was gonna be like an entry level version of Seven Wonders. And I'm like thinking it's already, Seven Wonders is not like a complicated game. Like how are you, what are you gonna do? And blah, 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 is this for kids? And we got a chance to play it. Some people had set it up and, they, and we happened to be walking by and said, hey, this is set up, do you wanna play? It's ready to go. And we're like, sure, I'll find out. And then we were totally blown away by this game because we're not the biggest fans of Seven Wonders, simply because when you're passing cards around and stuff, things get messed up with the card drafting because people don't necessarily play at the same pace. And like, it always ends up that someone has eight cards, someone has three, and you're like, something bad happened here. <laughs> and so it always gets a little bit messed up. So it discourages us from playing Seven Wonders. But Seven Wonders Architects kind of removes some of that because now every player has their own deck of cards that they place to their right or their left. And so you're always gonna have two decks of cards you can draw from, you or your partner, uh, but we're not passing hands of cards around. And so that keeps life a little bit simpler. And it, it kind of worked for me in terms of like, okay, I know how to work all this. Then it also puts everything around building a wonder of the world. That's your whole goal is to build your wonder. Your wonder is gonna give you different kind of uh, rewards and stuff. So it feels a little asymmetrical in the way you play. Like I'm gonna have a different kind of feeling to my character because of these bonuses I'm gonna get. And it simplifies things by saying like, you don't need specifically this resource. You just need three resources that are different or three resources that are the same, which is a beautiful, like easy way to kind of deal with something because it's all symbology. It takes away, you know, um, I think some of those confusion moments and stuff between like, was well, it brick or stone or wood? Like just make them different or make them the same. So this one just like went down really smooth. It's a beautiful production. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> I really did not expect to come away from that game thinking, I really want that game. And now it's on my high, you know, want to get list. Uh, Seven Wonders Architects just really did a great job. And that's why it's our number two. Our number one is a game we have been trying to play for literally years, and that is Coimbra. We have seen Coimbra just on shelves, on places, and just been like, I don't know why, I just wanna play this game. It's just got a really good look to it. We know it's like a Euro game. We really love Eggert Spiel as a, as a publisher. So we're like, it's an Spiel game. It looks really, really good. We love Euro games. We just, we wanna play it, we wanna play it. And then every time we're at a convention, every time we're at a game night where it is, it just keeps, something happens, we don't end up playing it. We just, something else gets played or we don't have time or something like that. We finally, finally, finally had a friend uh, shout out to Jabs, uh, teach us. And it was so much fun. Oh my gosh, it lived up to the hype that we made in our heads. 
and we had so, so much fun. This is a game where you're kind of drafting out these cards and putting them in and going up tracks. We love games where you're going up tracks, you know. Mike talked about Cora earlier, going up tracks. We like track games. And you're going up these different tracks, and this game has all these different kinds of phases, and it's one of those one of those games where you're getting cards, but the cards will kind of activate and do stuff in different phases. And we really, really like that in games because it just kind of makes you plan in multiple different places at once. And we find that very satisfying. So Coimbra just blew the roof off for us. It was one of those situations where we had kind of hyped it up in our heads and we've been wanting and trying to get it played for years. And we finally got to play it and oh, it was good. And we were like, yes. Thank God, because it would have sucked if that game sucked, but it didn't. It was Coin Bright. It's our number one. We are super pumped. So that was our top 10 games from BGG Con, all of which I think were new to us at that point. Yeah. Yeah, we played Dinosaur Island like half of it once before yeah, that. Yeah, that was in a proper full so game. So all new to us, which was super, super cool. That's what's so like, fun about conventions. Uh, you get a chance to like try well, the BGG so many BGG library is like, is honestly, like it's just, it's the best. It That's really awesome. is. Yeah, so uh, really, really great time. If you have a chance to check out BGG Con or BGG at Sea or any of the BGG stuff, honestly, check them out. If you like to sit around playing games, that's the conference. Really great vibes all the way around. Yeah, Couldn't really, really good stuff. But nonetheless, that's going to be it for us. Let us know down in the comments what you thought about all of these games, if you've played them, and what lists you would like to see us tackle next. Let us know down in the comments below. And until next time, I'm Nick. I'm Mike. We're the Brothers Murph, and we'll see you later. See you in the next top 10.